is African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Hello and welcome. Welcome to African News Tonight from the English to Africa service of The Voice of America, your source for pan-African news and world developments. I'm Iheyas Wuhib in Washington. Coming up on African News Tonight... What they're really doing is shoring up their partner uh, in more of a transactional relationship, and the counterterrorism label is used as a source of legitimacy more than a reflection of the actual mission. That's Emily Estelle with the American Enterprise Institute speaking about Russia's Wagner Group on Burkina Faso. Details coming up also. Pope Francis has arrived in South Sudan. Nigeria's election campaigns are in full swing. And Malawi struggles to contain a cholera outbreak. We'll have these stories and more on African News tonight. We start with our top story. Pope Francis has arrived in South Sudan on his first trip to the world's youngest country. He is joined by the head of the Church of England and the Church of Scotland moderator on what is being called a pilgrimage of peace. The Pope arrived just a day after a regional official said 27 people were killed in communal violence, as Sheila Pony reports from Juba, South Sudan. Pope Francis was received by top South Sudanese officials before heading to the residence of President Saif Akir. The 86-year-old leader of nearly 1.4 billion Catholics will meet with South Sudan's leaders on peace efforts and the humanitarian situation. Francis was accompanied by the leader of the Church of England, Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. The duo will be joined by moderator of the Church of Scotland, Reverend Ian Grinshields, who arrived in Juba earlier the day. The Holy See is calling their unique trip a non-denominational pilgrimage of peace in South Sudan, a country still suffering from years of civil war. The three church leaders arrived just a day after regional officials said 27 people were killed in communal conflict fueled by cattle theft. The killings took place in one of the counties in central Equatoria, the administrative state of the capital, Juba. In a tweet, Welbe said he was horrified at the death, calling it a story too often had across South Sudan. The Pope arrived from the Democratic Republic of Congo, where he spent several days this week calling for forgiveness among warring parties and holding a massive rally with Congolese youth. The Pope's visit to the two countries is part of the Vatican's efforts to help building lasting peace in the war-torn nations. Peace has been elusive to South Sudan since it gained independence from Sudan in 2011. South Sudanese have been waiting for the Pope's visit since last year. Francis was supposed to visit in July 2022, but had to push back the trip following a knee problem that has largely confined him to a wheelchair. Sheila Pony for VOA News, Juba, South Sudan. Tomorrow, we will have a special live South Sudan in Focus program about the Pope's trip to Juba. You can find it on voaafrica.com. Streaming begins at 16.30 UTC. A human rights group in Burkina Faso is accusing the army of killing at least 25 civilians in the eastern part of the country. According to the French news agency AFP, a group called the Collective of Communities Against Impunity and Stigmatization, CISC, attributed the deaths to the Burkinabi Defense and Security Forces. The group says the killings took place as a, as a convoy of more than 100 vehicles traveled through three areas on Wednesday. The CISC alleges that 12 people were killed in the village of Sakoni, seven in Piga, and six in the hamlet of Kankangu. The human rights group is calling for an independent investigation. There has been no response to the allegations by authorities. The army has been fighting an Islamic insurgency linked to Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State group for two years that has killed thousands and displaced two million people. 
A report by the American Enterprise Institute indicates military juntas in Burkina Faso and neighboring Mali have sought to partner with the Kremlin-linked Wagner Group to protect their regimes. Russia and Burkina Faso junta began preparing for Wagner's likely imminent deploying deployment into the country in December 2022. Emily Estelle, research manager at the AEI's Critical Threat Project, explained to VOA senior analyst Mohamed al Shanawi how Wagner became a replacement for Western counterterrorism efforts in the Sahel. I think the, the best way to think about the development of Wagner Group in Africa is to think about what service Wagner Group is, is offering to the countries it partners with. And uh, the first and most important service that these countries are receiving or think they're receiving is regime security. And so looking, for example, at either the leadership in Central African Republic or the military junta in Mali or uh, General Heftar in Libya, they're partnering with Wagner first and foremost to help shore up their defenses and combat their rivals. Oftentimes this is done in the language of counterterrorism. And sometimes Wagner is actually engaged against jihadist groups, but most of the time what they're really doing is shoring up their partner uh, in more of a transactional relationship. And the counterterrorism label is used as a source of legitimacy more than a reflection of the actual mission. Russia and Burkina Faso Junta began preparing for Wagner's likely imminent deployment into the country in December 2022. And the Malian Junta facility two meetings between Burkanabi and Russian officials, including an undisclosed visit by Burkanabi Prime Minister to Moscow. The Burkanabi junta then severed most of its ties with France in January. How would that hurt Western counterterrorism efforts? The Western counterterrorism apparatus in, in West Africa and the Sahel has, has almost completely deteriorated in, in a meaningful sense. And what I mean by that is that in Mali and now Burkina Faso, the French missions have shifted out and are now based out of their their primary base in the region in Niger. But not only have they shifted the relationships between Mali and now Burkina Faso and France and and several other European partners has really soured in a way that means that continued counterterrorism efforts in these countries are quite unlikely. And I will say that, that Russia and the Wagner Group, which is linked to the Kremlin, have stoked this dynamic intentionally. So certainly there are plenty of tensions that were pre-existing, but there have been active Russian efforts to cultivate the information space to to use propaganda to change change public opinion and to create their own partnerships with these with these countries and the Wagner presence is not only kind of dr- helping drive out other counterterrorism forces but it's actually actively counterproductive in that looking at at Mali Wagner group has been engaged alongside the Malian military in uh, collective punishment and human rights abuses against populations which they've accused of being linked to jihadists and the only thing that that kind of response does is actually force vulnerable communities to partner with armed groups, including jihadist groups, for self-defense. And so I'd say Wagner is not certainly not doing counterterrorism work, but is making the conditions worse. Experts say Russia uses its partnerships with African countries' hunters to evade Western sanctions and re-establish Russia as a global power. Can you explain how? Yes. When you look at the partnerships between Wagner Group and these various countries, looking at Central African Republic first, uh, but now um, other countries in in West Africa, the deal is often about sanctions evasion. So Wagner is providing a a regime security service, but it's also receiving something. And these countries don't necessarily have a lot of cash that they can pay for this service. And so Wagner is instead receiving payment in various ways that include mining concessions, access to precious gems and minerals. And those businesses are both a a money-making venture in and of themselves, but also a money laundering tool to help Wagner and by extension its partners in the Kremlin to evade Western sanctions more more broadly. So when you look at the kind of expansion of the Wagner Group, you can think of it as part of a larger criminal enterprise that's in part meant to build resilience for the Russian state system around international pressure. That was Emily Estelle, research manager at the AEI's Critical Threat Project. She spoke to my colleague Mohamed al Shinawi. A Swiss appeals court has ended hearing of a former rebel commander accused of war crimes during Liberia's brutal civil wars over two decades ago. Alui Kosaya 
was sentenced to 20 years in prison in June 2021 for rape, murder and cannibalism in one of the first trials for war crimes committed in the West African country. His legal team asked the court in Belinozia, Switzerland, to overturn a lower court ruling that found him guilty of crimes against humanity. According to Reuters News Service, his lawyer says he was a minor and not present at the time of the crimes. The prosecution argues that his actions were widespread and systemic against civilians. A guilty verdict by the three-judge panel, which is expected on June 1st, could extend his punishment to life in prison. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. Campaigns are in full swing for Nigeria's February 25th presidential election, and some Nigerians are taking a look at how parties are getting their message out. Mike Bonnier reports from Port Harcourt. Nigeria has strict rules for election campaigning. For instance, until September, Independent Electoral Commission of Nigeria, or INEC, banned political campaigning by parties and their candidates. INEC also has warned the parties to avoid using abusive language against opponents and the commission advised parties and candidates to focus on issues in their campaigns. With the first ballot to be cast on February 25th in the presidential and national assembly elections, some Nigerians have mixed reactions to the campaigns. Patrick Samuel is a political analyst in Port Harcourt. Um, actually, um, I would say on the one hand, I'm, I'm impressed by candidates themselves. However, I'm also not um, impressed about the behavior of followership. Now, there have been cases of um, toggery, you know, shooting of guns, harassment of politicians across the country. And uh, we need to address that presently. And the, the oppressive uh, apparatus of government need to be alert so they can suppress this new development in the polity. Samuel says he's impressed with the way the parties have been selling their points to the people. Dr. Kamde Benjamin, a Portacot based businessman, however, sees the campaigns in a different way. Uh, so far, it has not met my own expectations because uh, I was expecting the parties to come up with issues that relate to the problems facing Nigerians. But what we see right now is accusations and counter accusations and uh, things that does not have any bearing to the welfare of Nigerians. Benjamin calls on relevant Nigerian security agencies to check reported violence at campaign venues to prevent injuries. Housewife Susan Wine is disappointed that the parties and candidates have not spoken about gender-related issues in their campaigns. As women, we have observed and discovered that it hasn't really been issue-based. Rather, it's been hateful speeches here and there from these politicians, causing them to lose focus of what they really supposed to tell the populace. And for these reasons, we are all discouraged, especially the women, because we haven't really heard much from them in line with what they have or what they have put in their mandate for the women. Winner says, however, a few candidates have spoken about their programs for women during private visits to their campaign offices. The electoral body says campaigns for the presidential and national assembly races will end at midnight on February 23rd. The governorship and state assembly elections are set for March 11, and those campaigns will end on March 9th. This is Mike Mbonye for VOA News in Port Harcourt, Nigeria. Cholera cases are increasing around the world due to climate factors such as floods, droughts, and conflict. 
Forced displacement also contributes to the rise as there often is limited access to clean water in the refugee and displacement camps, among other factors. Doctors Without Borders, or MSF, says 30 countries have recently experienced outbreaks. Merijan Morinar is MSF head of cholera response in Malawi. VOA's Douglas Mpuga reached her for an update on the situation. With the cholera outbreak, if uh, currently the total number stands at 36,258 people affected. Uh, so it is the biggest outbreak in Malawi since the 90s. Um, today, the, the number of new cases on a daily basis is very high. Today, it's at 678. Each day there are around 12 admitted in the uh, cholera treatment units or centers and all districts in Malawi are currently affected. 28 out of 29 districts currently have cases. Uh, the, The last district does not have cases now, but every district in the country has been affected by this outbreak. So it is a huge outbreak uh, with a current number of death toll that stands at 1,186. Does the Malawi government, plus your organization, have enough resources to handle the outbreak? Currently, there are, uh, when we started here, when MSF, when Doctors Without Borders started um, responding to this outbreak, um, you know, cholera is endemic in Malawi, and, and uh, already in March of this year, cases were reported. Um, in September, the number went up significantly. So, uh, Doctors Without Borders, we were the first to respond in November of last year, at which time you know, medications needed or other items needed to treat cholera were were not available in large numbers. Currently, there is a lot of attention for this outbreak. Other actors have started to come in, and so there are now a lot of donations to uh, the Ministry of Health to respond to the cholera outbreak. We understand their their shortage of vaccines. How, what's the situation like as far as vaccines are concerned? So there is a worldwide um, cholera vaccine shortage. Malawi did receive vaccines last year. I believe the number that they received was something like five million, which is not sufficient to vaccinate the entire population. And currently. There are only here and there small numbers of vaccinations left. Um, For instance, in Blantyre, they still have some vaccines left, but there is not enough uh, oral cholera vaccine to go around. This has to do with the worldwide shortage. That was Mirijan Molinar, the head of MSF's cholera response in Malawi. She spoke with Douglas Mpuga from Blantyre, Malawi. A court in Kenya has sentenced three policemen from 24 years in prison to the death penalty for murdering a human rights lawyer, his client, and their driver in 2016. Victoria Munga reports from Nairobi, Kenya. Her verdict delivered Friday, Justice Jesse Lassit sentenced police officer Frederick Leliman to death. Leliman is believed to have been the mastermind behind the murder of human rights lawyer and activist Willie Kimani, his client Josephat Mwenda and their taxi driver Joseph Moiruri in June 2016. Lassit described the murder as most foul and heinous. I find that the most suitable sentence for each of the accused persons is as follows. The first accused is sentenced to death in each of the three counts. The death sentence in counts two and three are held in abeyance. Two other former police officers, Stephen Cheburet and Sylvia Wanjohi, were sentenced to 30 years and 24 years in prison, respectively. The officers informant Peter Ngugi, who is believed to have facilitated Kimani's murder, was sentenced to 20 years in jail. The defendants have two weeks to appeal. 
Under Kenyan law, death sentences are commuted to life imprisonment, but a 2017 ruling by Kenya Supreme Court gave judges the discretion to decide whether a death sentence can still be imposed. Rights activists say at the time of murders, Kimani was defending Mwenda, a motorbike rider who had allegedly been shot by the police. Kimani's murder brought attention to the ongoing issue of extrajudicial killings by police in Kenya. The Kenya National Commission on Human Rights says at least 94 people were killed extrajudicially by police in 2022. President William Ruto has said such killings must end. Victoria Amunga for VOA News, Nairobi. VOA VOA Africa is your trusted source for news, sports, entertainment and music. Stay engaged with VOA Africa. We love to hear your voice. You can call us 24-7 on WhatsApp and leave a message. Leave comments, requests or greetings. We may play your message on VOA Africa. Dial the international code plus one, then 202 258 3076. VOA Africa is always happy to hear your voice. The number again is the international code plus one, then 202 258 3076. And that wraps up this edition of African News Tonight. I'm Yeheyes Wuhib in Washington. For all the latest developments on the continent 24-7, visit our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of our producer, Mokbilia Baro, and our engineer, Nelson Lopes, thanks for choosing the Voice of America. Next, an editorial reflecting the